You know, it's remarkable, we discovered last time that what we're looking at is the destruction of a literal city by the name of Babylon. A lot of controversy about this. A lot of folks think, oh, I don't think that's really Babylon. That must be uh, maybe New York City, because it talks an awful lot about commerce, or maybe it's London or Paris. No, it's actually Babylon. Did you know the United States of America has put a million dollars towards the reconstruction of Babylon through the United Nations, which is putting in many millions of dollars into the reconstruction of the literal Babylon in Iraq? Astounding. If you went there today, you discovered that the two palaces already built are built in exactly the same place that Nebuchadnezzar built them thousands of years ago. God, thank you for this chapter, thank you for this book, and thank you that you think that this city of Babylon is so important that you have dedicated two entire chapters, the entire book of Revelation, to it. So Lord, we pray that we might give it also the same importance in the study. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, John sees a remarkable vision. He sees this indescribably ugly old harlot. Babylon the Great, stamped right across her forehead, and she's riding on a seven-headed beast with ten horns. Now, we know what the uh, beasts were, that the, uh, the beasts were the seven world empires that the harlot dominates, the ten horns of the last ten nations of the revived Roman Empire that have yet to come into existence. And the picture that John is giving for us in Revelation is this harlot has dominated world empires from the get-go, right from the Babylonian back further, the Assyrian back further, the Egyptian empire, every world human empire or system has been dominated by a disgusting, old, ugly harlot. Little wonder there's been no peace and been a lot of misery in this old world for the last 6,000 years. John says, listen to this now, and I'm in the 17th chapter. I'm just looking at verse 13, 15 rather. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Here is an image for you. I hope you can get this one out of your mind so you can sleep tonight. This old harlot, John says, is sitting on many waters, and that speaks of peoples, tongues, languages, ugly, old, fat, disgusting prostitute sitting on the back of poor, old humanity. You ever had a heavy set person sit on you? It just sucks all the air right out of your lungs. Here's a picture for you. Here is this disgusting old harlot sitting on the back of humanity, and they're, they're gasping to try to get their next breath. This is the picture that God's painting for us. This old gal has caused more problems than you can shake a stick at. Little wonder that man is in such despair. I found a very sad statistic recently, or heard of at least. The suicide rate has gone up 30% in the last 10 years in America. 30% in the last 10 years in America. The old harlot sitting on top of people causing despair. The Word of God despised a society that makes light of the Bible of the Lord Jesus, dominated by this old harlot that offers absolutely no hope. And these people are gasping for breath and they wonder, what is life all about? What's it all about? Is it even worth living? I haven't found a purpose in living. And they tell me I'm nothing more than a product of, of evolution anyway. So if I die, what difference does it make? I'm not going anywhere. It'll be out of my misery. Suicide rate up among particularly young people. Very sad statistic. An old harlot sitting on their back, sucking the air out of their lungs, bringing them to the point of despair. What a picture. But that pictures it quite perfectly. 
exactly what this spiritual system of Babylon is doing. Now drop on down to the 18th chapter. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every foul spirit, and cage for every unclean and hated bird. Let me stop right there. This angel comes down. He has great authority. And the Bible says the earth is illuminated by his presence. And by the way, if you'd been alongside of the angel, you would have been looking at a very sad old earth. Because at this juncture, approximately half of the world's population have already perished. Most of the cities of the world lie in ruins. The Antichrist has ruined the planet. There's mass starvation. There's wars going on. Conflicts everywhere. Chaos, total chaos. The devil is in total control. And this, this angel says, Babylon, Babylon the great has fallen. That's good news. The heavens rejoice at this news. Babylon the, the great has fallen and has become a, a cage for every unclean bird and a, a, a lodging place for demons, a final, a final home for demons. And by the way, the prophet Zechariah pictures this beautifully. We studied that quite recently. The prophet Zechariah says, I saw a woman sitting in a basket and a lead top was put in the basket and the basket was flown off to the city of Babylon, Shinar, same place. And this is a picture, my friends. This is a picture of the bride of Christ finally being subdued, the old spiritual harlot placed in the abyss where she can trouble people no longer. Not only is the physical city destroyed, but the bride of the Antichrist is confined, never to be released again. Quite a picture. The Lord Jesus has a bride, and that's the church. Every born again child of God is a member of that spiritual church. She's beautiful, she's holy, because he's made us such. And when the world needs to find answers to what life is all about, there's only one place it can go, not to the psychiatrist or the psychologist, but to a child of God who knows God in a personal way. On the other hand, the Antichrist, who is a great imitator, the great counterfeit, also has a bride. One third of the angels that fell with him when he was kicked out of heaven, when he rebelled against God, have become his spiritual bride. And the world is dominated by these demons, also known as the great harlot. Instead of disseminating, disseminating the truth, she disseminates lies and misinformation and hatred and bitterness and hopelessness and despair. That's what the old harlots like. That is her modus operandi. Now, Apostle John says, I saw the old harlot. Babylon is destroyed. And listen to it again. This is remarkable. Babylon the great is fallen has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Now this is remarkable. God's giving a warning. The city has not been destroyed yet. And a voice comes from heaven, and you can be sure that only God's people could hear it. Come out of her, my people. Babylon is going to be destroyed. It's imminent. She's ripe for destruction. Come out. At least you share her plagues. This is not unlike what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, by the way. <laughs> Very similar. Sodom and Gomorrah was guilty of two things. One of them was rampant homosexuality, the rape of children. 
And also, they didn't take care of the poor, although they were extraordinarily wealthy. Now we see a city that is given over to sexual immorality and also given over to rampant luxury and selfishness and not helping the poor. And God makes a statement, makes a call to his people who are in that city evangelizing, time to leave. Happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. God said a lot. Bring your family out, get, get your wife, and get your daughters and sons-in-laws, and get out of the city because it's going to be destroyed. The similarity between the two cities is astounding, is it not? Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she has rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her, for the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am no widow. Listen to the arrogance of the city. And I will see no sorrow. This is the disgusting city. This is a tale of two cities, the city of Jerusalem and the city of Babylon. Only city mentioned more than Babylon in the Bible is the city of Jerusalem. That's not by mistake. Jerusalem is a picture of heaven. The Lord Jesus, the sacrifice for sin, died outside the gates of Jerusalem. The temple of God was on Mount Zion inside the city. It showed the way to get into the presence of God. It's a little picture of heaven. We discovered in the third chapter, fourth chapter of Revelation, that God the Father was sitting on the throne and sitting next to him was Jesus, who is our advocate, our lawyer. And his blood is right there in heaven, and he pleads our cause. The city of Jerusalem was a picture of the heavenly city. And the city of Babylon is a picture of another place, a place that resembles the people who are living there and the leader and the one who is running it is a picture of, if you might, don't mind me saying so, hell. <laughs> That's, it was started by Nimrod, the first rebel. It was a counterfeit city. It consisted of two components, a city, and it was a huge city. The walls were 100 feet tall, 80 feet tall wide. It was huge. It straddled the Euphrates River. It was a magnificent, oh, it was fancy, folks, believe me. There was a tunnel that went right underneath the river, and a traveler walking from one side of the river to the other going through the tunnel could stop in the middle and have a cup of tea because it was a restaurant right down at the bottom. Can you imagine? Sophisticated, but it's a city of Satan. It was started by Nimrod, the first picture of Antichrist in the scripture. And those ziggurats, those towers, they were, they were towers to worship the stars. They had this, the sign of the zodiac in them. This is where, it's a, it is the mother of all false religions. The demons went out from the city, permeated the world, twisted people's thinking, led people down the wrong path to despair, to suicide, and ultimately to hell. And now the chickens have come home to roost, big time. Now God is fed up. This is the end of the tribulation period, approximately three, maybe two days before Armageddon. And this city that had dominated the entire world, God is going to judge. And here we see the arrogance of the city, even at this juncture, in light of the utter failure that the Antichrist and his false prophets have brought about to the world. There is no peace after all. The first three and a half years was as phony as a $3 bill, but nothing but war since. This guy thinks he is the Messiah. Oh, he does. He does. And the world is still convinced? Oh, they are. Totally. Hook, line, and sinker. They're wearing his mark on their forehead and on their hand. How else could they do business in the city of Babylon? And how else could the world be rich? And at this juncture, for many people, it was. And this arrogant city says, I am a queen. And who is going to dethrone me? I'm never be going to become a widow. 
This is reminiscent, by the way, of Nebuchadnezzar's words. The original king during the greatest reign of Babylon. And he walked out in one of his palace balconies, and he looked over that great city with its hanging gardens, and he said, is this not great Babylon, the city that I made for my glory and my majesty? He wasn't a humble man, was he? Something else you might find remarkable. When he went out on that balcony, he not only saw the, saw the glories of the city of Babylon, but he saw the great hanging gardens of Babylon that he himself constructed. His wife was from Persia, and she was kind of sick and tired of the flats of the, the Shinar Valley, and she said, you know what, couldn't you kind of make it a little bit prettier, maybe something, big garden or something, that when I went out on the balcony, I'd see some nice green, something even look, lift it up like a mountain kind of, like a big garden in the air. Could you do that for me? Of course I can do, you for that. do that for you, sweetie. So he built the seven, one of the seven wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. You might find this interesting. Two most important gardens in the Bible. Garden of Eden, which is about probably 40 or 50 miles away from Babylon, and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, as I mentioned, one of the seven wonders of the world. Accident, the counterfeit city with a counterfeit religion builds a counterfeit Garden of Eden. Hmm. Something interesting you might find about psychopaths, not that you need to know necessarily, if you don't already, they like to keep little souvenirs. When they murder people, they steal something off of their body and bring it on home and drag it on out once in a while to glory in their great success of overcoming and murdering somebody. Psychopaths. That's why they call them psychopaths. I believe with all my heart that the city of Babylon, being constructed as I preach this message, We'll also someday have another hanging garden there because it is a counterfeit of the Garden of Eden. And Satan, the ruler of the city, can gloat over his garden, his counterfeit garden, because that, after all, was his chief success. He caused the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. And now he's got this counterfeit garden to remind him of his great success. But he brought the downfall and destruction of humanity. Two gardens. One's real, and the other is fake. This is a remarkable city. We discover at this juncture she's still proud. One day before destruction. If you write over this chapter, before the fall comes pride. Let's continue the story. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death, mourning, famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see her smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon! that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Interesting thing when it says the kings of the earth committed fornication. In original Greek, it, the word is sensuality. You might have that in your old King James. That word is only found in one book of the Bible, there. It is a word that means rampant, gross immorality, a kind of sin that even the city of Corinth and the city of Rome would not be guilty of. This is a city that gives itself over completely to every kind of perverted sexual sin that you can even imagine, mingled all with unbridled capitalism without a conscience. What a toxic mix that God finds when he comes down to destroy this wicked city. They will weep and lament for her when they see her smoke and her burning. 
standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her. No one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, a long, 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 long list. And I'm not going to read the whole list because the broadcast will be up by the time I got to the bottom. But God's trying to make a point. He goes right on down, starting in gold, silver, precious things, things that men will die for. They'd kill their grandmother for these things. The lost of the world, then it gets less expensive, less expensive. Gets on down to animals, but notice the last thing on the list of what these people are making a fortune at selling. And see this from God's standpoint. Listen to it. Fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and the bodies and souls of men. The very last thing in the list, the bodies and souls of men. The Antichrist is a great enslaver, and that's what Satan always does. He brings people into bondage. The Lord Jesus came to set people free. Satan came to bring them into bondage. Whether it's sexual bondage, any kind of sin can bring horrible bondage, squeeze the life out of you, bring you into despair and hopelessness. In this case, even physical bond slavery. We're talking about slavery here. The Antichrist, as he conquers nation after nation like the old Caesars of old did, they brought the population out. They killed a lot of them. A lot of them they made slaves out of. When Caesar conquered Israel, he brought the slaves out. The people became slaves. They built the Colosseum in Rome. And slaves were so plentiful after the destruction and conquest of Israel, they were selling for pittance on the market. This man's going to bring the whole world into bondage. And the Lord Jesus is going to come back and he's going to free him. Even God's people are going to be made slaves of the Antichrist. That's what God finds when he comes back to this despicable, wicked, gross city. Can we blame him for destroying it and freeing the people? Listen to this. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. Here we go again. Weeping and mourning. Oh, they've lost their money. Money's everything to them. This is unbridled capitalism without a conscience. This is a kind of, kind of capitalism where you're bowing down to the almighty dollar. And that's really what you're worshiping. That's what they were worshiping. Why does God hate the love of money? Doesn't hate money. He hates the love of money because it's a replacement for him. When you don't have God in your life, you always attempt to fill it up with things and stuff and trinkets and money. And this is what the world is into. The Antichrist, oh, he's a great businessman, brother. He's got a business plan that's just out of this world. And he's making people rich like crazy. And he's doing it through the city. Listen to this now. Verse 14. The fruit of your soul long for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid are gone from you. And you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Oh, they're, they're having a bad day, folks. And saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour, in one hour, such great witches have come to nothing. You could write over those verses. The words of Jesus, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? 
These people have sold their souls to the devil. Not unlike a lot of people in the country that we're living in. Their whole life is all about money. The exclusion of God. Totally. Try to fill up an emptiness that only God can fill up. Trying to find happiness and meaning and purpose in finances. And it'll always fail. Always leave you empty. Like they asked J.P. Morgan, how much money does it take to make you happy? His answer was, just a little bit more. Weeping and wailing, they're going to die no more than two days from this event? This event is two days before Armageddon. I may be wrong. It might be three days. It might even be four. It is immediately before Armageddon, and they're worrying about losing money? Reminds me of the story of Barnum and, and Bailey, the guys that started that circus years ago. Barnum was on his deathbed, and he whispered to, to, to <clears throat> his partner, the last words out of his mouth. The guy was dying on the last words out of his mouth. What were the receipts? Does it really make any difference what the receipts are? Can't take it with you. Listen to this. Each shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Two thoughts. Number one, when this city is destroyed, there's two people who are not going to be there. One is the Antichrist, and the other is the false prophet. How do I know that? Two or three days later, they're in Jerusalem, mustering the armies of the world together for the Battle of Armageddon, a battle that is intent on stopping Jesus from coming back from heaven to take over possession of the planet. After all, he is the great ruler of this world, but that's all going to end. And when he is in Jerusalem mustering his armies, he no doubt hears the word, we got some bad news for you. Was there good news associated with the bad? No good news, it's all bad. Babylon, Babylon, our great capital has been destroyed. How could that be? God destroyed it. Fire came down from heaven like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's gone. And all of our business partners, their, their, their ships wouldn't even go up the Euphrates. They were out in the gulf there, and they saw the smoke rising in the air. They were frightened to death. They wouldn't go any closer. Not good news. The Antichrist days are numbered. The city's days are numbered. Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be captured when Jesus comes back, alive, and cast into hell, alive. The very first two people into hell will be the Antichrist and his false prophet. Their days are numbered. Thank God he is going to put an end to this whole ugly mess and set things right. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said but my words will never pass away. Remarkable. But notice, it's not unhappy for everybody. Here it is, verse 20, 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles, and you prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Heaven is having a party. This is interesting for two reasons. Number one, because it's so good to see justice finally come about. He's come to set the captive free. He's come to bring justice to the righteous people and bring judgment to the wicked people. Finally, finally, the wicked will no longer reign. They have destroyed the planet. God's not happy. It comes back. One hour, Babylon is destroyed, and heaven breaks out in rejoicing. 
we're going to be there, folks. All those who are born again will be in heaven, and we will know what's going on in the earth. We're told, and maybe even we might even see it. I don't know. All I know is we get the news. Babylon's been destroyed. The good news is Satan's on his way out. This is his last gasp. Jesus is going to leave heaven and take possession of the planet, and we're going with him. Friends, a tale of two cities. Jerusalem versus Babylon. The good news is Jerusalem wins. Jerusalem wins. Verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, trumpets, shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman or any craft shall be found in you anymore. Nor the sound of a millstone shall be found in you anymore. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom, the bride, shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. And thigh, and for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets, the saints, and all who were slain on the earth. This is a remarkable story. Just as surely as the word of God said that Jesus the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judea by the prophet Micah 500 years before he was born, this also will come to pass precisely the way we have just described it and read it. This is the word of God. This isn't something that might happen. This is going to happen. You can take that to the bank. And something else you can take to the bank, too. There's a lesson for you and I. Unbridled capitalism of a conscience is evil. And God considers it evil. <laughs> Listen, there was a company quite recently, a large pharmaceutical company. They were producing a painkiller called Vioxx. And it was helping people with the arthritic pain, but they were dying of heart failure. And there were thousands of them dying by heart failure, and they finally linked the two together, and they said, this stuff is dangerous. It's killing people. And through discovery, what lawyer talk, what they do is they go into the files of these large pharmaceutical companies, they discovered that they knew it was killing people. And even when they developed the drug, the painkiller, they knew one of the side effects was heart failure. Hundreds of thousands of people died from taking that one lousy drug. That, friends, is capitalism without a conscience that is pure evil. That's what gangsters do. Let you and I be very, very, very careful. We're not seduced into thinking that somehow we just have enough money, I'll be content. Apostle Paul says, I have learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ, whether I am have a lot or whether I have a little. And what Paul is saying is, doesn't make any difference whether I got a million bucks in the banks or two dollars. My joy is not based upon how much money I've got. It's based upon my fellowship with Jesus. I find joy and peace in Him and Him alone. He has filled the big emptiness inside. I don't need a lot of silly trinkets to do that because that doesn't work. Jesus put it this way, beware of covetousness. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of the things that he owns. Why do you act like pagans, Jesus said, worrying about what you're going to eat, how you're going to be clothed? Doesn't God clothe the birds of the air? Doesn't God feed the birds and clothe the lilies of the field? Aren't you of more value than them? Seek first the kingdom and everything else will be added to you. Put God first in your life. If you want to describe the city of Babylon, the city that put things first. And God was left out of the equation entirely. Don't make that mistake. Even as a child of God, put God first. He'll take care of you. Don't be like the heathen. That's Jesus' words. Beware of covetousness. Man's life consists more 
than the things that he owns. I want to thank you for joining us. Next week we talk about the greatest event in all of human history, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be sure to join us and thank you for joining us for today's broadcast.